Mystery of Messamore, April 2022 Quarterly Event. This is Karen Schwartz, President, Historical Society of Harrison County, Indiana. Who, what, when, where, why? It has been over 70 years since the Van Diver family mysteriously disappeared deep in Crawford County's cave country. The year was 1949 when the disappearance was reported by William Messimore. The police and hundreds of volunteers searched the Hemlock Cliffs area where the Van Divers lived for days, but turned up absolutely nothing although many suspected that Messamore was involved. Like a true crime episode, the Messamore story has everything. A missing family, armed bank robbery, third-degree interrogations, car, boat, and jewelry theft, double crosses, rumored romance, isolated hideouts, dog napping, arson, jailbreaks and escapes, breathtaking scenery, extradition, an acetylene torch, accomplices, aliases, appeals, Alcatraz, mysterious riddles, covert secrets in lockboxes, cryptic writings, circumstantial evidence, false leads, and much more. Watch this YouTube video, Mystery of Messamore, to learn more about the baffling life story of mysterious William Desi Messamore. Messamore Timeline 1916, born in rural Christian County, Kentucky. 1920s, grows up at the city dump on River Road in Louisville, Kentucky. 1933, first arrested and convicted in Frankfurt armed robbery, in and out of prison till parole in 1947. 1947, buys farm in Crawford County, Indiana, near Hemlock Cliffs. 1948, August 12th. Rob's Bank in Cavill, Kentucky. 1949, January 7th, last sighting of Van Diver family. 1949, January 19th, reports that the Van Diver family is missing. 1949, February 12th, arrested on dog stealing charge as well as suspicion of murder. 1949, March 14th, escapes from Harrison County Jail in Corridon, Indiana. Timeline continued. 1949, March 15th, recaptured in Brandenburg, Kentucky. 1949, June 14th, Escapes from McCracken County Jail in Paducah, Kentucky. 1949, June 15th, recaptured in a coal car in Princeton, Kentucky. 1949, June 22nd to 23rd, convicted, sentenced on robbery, jailbreak charges in Kentucky. 1950, March 22nd, sent to Alcatraz. 1962, October 17th, leaves Alcatraz and sent to Terre Haute, Indiana to finish federal sentence. 1965, released from federal custody and jailed by Kentucky for parole violation. 1970s, lives a quiet life in Highland Park neighborhood in Louisville after release from prison. 1980s, interviewed by Crawford County, Indiana Sheriff Pete Eastridge. 1986, February 12th, passes away. 
and the truth about his involvement in the Van Diver disappearance died with him. Birth, he was born in Christian County, Kentucky on December 16, 1916. Christian County is located in southwestern Kentucky in the Penny Royal, a mint plant region. William Desi Messamore's family. His father was James Alva, Alvi or Alvin Messamore, 1895-1969. His mother was Doshi Elizabeth Downs Messamore Colgate, 1893-1961. Their children together were James Edward Colgate, 1912-1975, William Desi Messamore, 1916-1986, and Bertha Elizabeth Messimore, 1917 to 1921. Messimore's early life. Site of Dashi Colgate's home at 1342 River Road. Today, it's the Lux Lounge. Historic River Road in Louisville, Kentucky. Messimore's father deserted the family and his parents divorced in 1920. Messamore reported that he did not remember ever seeing his father. The mother and children moved to Henderson, Kentucky for about a year, then relocated to Louisville, Kentucky. His mother married Harrison Colgate, who became Messamore's new stepfather. The Colgate family lived at 1342 River Road in Louisville, in a house constructed from materials they scavenged from the city dump located there. Messamore began his education when he was six at Market Street School in Louisville, but attended irregularly and quit when he was 13. He was declared a juvenile delinquent and sent to Ormsby Village and Greendale Reform School, from which he escaped. Messamore completed the sixth grade. He later completed the equivalent of the eighth grade while imprisoned. After dropping out of school, he assisted his stepfather as a huckster on a vegetable truck peddling route. Messamore held a variety of short-term factory jobs, six months or less, as a laborer in the laundry, dairy, hardware, and lumber industries as a young man. But his attendance and performance were sporadic, and Messamore was labeled a not easily supervised employee. The wives of William Desi Messamore, no children. William Desi Messamore had at least three wives. Number one, Myrtle May England Messamore, Married April 12, 1947, that's the date on official records, Messamore said 1937. Lasted a few days, then he took her back to her mother. Number two, Laureen Kipper Messamore. Married November 29, 1947, lived together a few months, divorced February 24, 1948. And number three. Elsie Despain Messamore, married May 4th, 1948, separated after one month. While in prison, Messamore asked permission to correspond with Mrs. Maggie McElwain, a widow who lived at 4513 Louisville Avenue, Louisville, Kentucky, as well as with his mother and his brother. Messamore's brushes with the law prior to the Van Diver disappearance. Messamore's rap sheet. November 16, 1933, armed robbery, Frankfort, Kentucky, six years. He served three years, was paroled February 17, 1937, right after devastating 1937 flood. Violated parole, may be wanted. October 25, 1937, investigation, Indiana State Police, 
Seymour, released. January 5th, 1938, Grand Larceny, Louisville, Kentucky, filed away. March 1st, 1938, Armed Robbery, Jefferson Circuit Court, sentenced to life imprisonment and sent to LaGrange Reformatory, then Eddyville Penitentiary. In May 1938, he escaped from City Hospital by jumping out a window. Paroled March 8, 1947. Metamore comes to Crawford County, Indiana, and buys a farm near Mifflin, which is located above the A in the word Crawford County on the map. You see a picture of the Mifflin store as well as the location of Crawford County in Indiana. Crawford County, Indiana map showing townships. Messamore's farm was in Union Township. Near Hemlock Cliffs, National Forest Road, English, Crawford County, Indiana, USA. Hemlock Cliffs, south of Messamore's farm, is a small box canyon hidden within the Hoosier National Forest in Crawford County and can be accessed by a two-mile hiking loop. Limestone cliffs rise 200 feet above the canyon with two waterfalls, Messamore Cliff Falls and Hemlock Cliff Falls, at each end. It offers a unique ecosystem and is open year-round. The Rock House, the site of Messamore Cliffs, Falls, and Spring in the Hoosier National Forest. A short distance north of the village of Mifflin, south of Messamore's farm, is a boldly escarped outcrop of conglomerate sandstone projecting far enough to form a wide rock house cave, which from the ashes, flint, and stone implements found within has been used as a shelter by Native Americans. This rock house is 300 feet long and averages 15 feet deep. Native American use of this house is indicated by the great number of flint chips, broken knives, scrapers, etc. found at the rock house site. Here are more pictures of the rock house at Messmore Cliffs. Hiding places abound in Hemlock Cliffs area. Check out these hidden spots. These photos were taken in January 2022 near the time of year when the Van Diver family went missing. Location in Crawford County, Indiana, near Mifflin atop Saltwell Hill, bordering Hemlock Cliffs. So Messamore showed up in Crawford County, Indiana. William Desi Messamore purchased a 20-acre farm in Crawford County in 1947. Although his neighbors in the isolated community didn't know anything about his prison record. He said he purchased this farm for his mother, but it also provided a secluded place to hide out. Messamore's farmhouse was located near Hemlock Cliffs, near the tiny hamlet of Mifflin, Messamore's house set atop Saltwell Hill, so named for the Benham Saltwell located there. The topography features an expanse of cliffs in the backyard full of gullies, sinkholes, and caves, ideal terrain for concealing evidence. Trail off of Hatfield Road, which is off of Governor's Trace, leading to the Messamore farm site 
on private property. Daffodils, Narcissus, Yucca, Forsythia, etc. indicate location of former homes, farms, etc. Neighbors' observations about the arrival of William Desi Messimore. It was like he came from nowhere almost, neighbor Gerald Hughes, his closest neighbor, said in an interview posted on Clever Intuition, in which he described the appearance of William Messimore. One morning we woke up and had a new neighbor. You said he knew when Messimore was gone because of the absence of his truck. Since the hill leading up to his house, Saltwell Hill, was too steep to bother climbing up with his truck, Messimore would just park down at the bottom of the hill near the used house and hike up to his isolated tiny farmhouse. Messimore's neighbors reported that he was different and was often gone for extended periods. Some of the neighbors said that he made them feel uncomfortable, but no one really had much interaction with him except for his neighbors, the Van Diver family who lived a quarter of a mile away. Other neighbors stated he was a good neighbor and that everybody in that isolated spot helped each other out when they needed to. Life on the Messamore Farm. Although Messamore spent some of his time on the 20-acre farm in Crawford County, Indiana, he never actually did any farm work on it at all. Local writer, H.O. Whitey Jones summed up Messamore's movements this way. Messamore was a character about whose pursuits little was known and who was in and out of the area every whip stitch. The Van Diver family, Messamore's neighbors, also lived nearby on a farm in Crawford County. Number one, Thomas, Tom Roy Van Diver, age 30. Tom had local ties and served in the U.S. Army during World War II, then came back to farm. Number two, Beatrice Nay Fisher Johnson Van Diver, age 44. And number three, Wanda Louise Johnson, age 17, Beatrice's daughter from a previous marriage. Thomas Van Diver became Wanda's stepfather when he married Beatrice. Tom and Beatrice had married in August 1948. Both had been married previously and both were divorced. Scandalous rumors circulated that linked Messamore romantically with Wanda, the daughter of Beatrice and stepdaughter of Tom Van Diver his neighbors. Messamore was nearly twice Wanda's age. Messamore, 32. Wanda, 17. The Van Diver farmhouse mysteriously burned in September 1948. The cause of the fire has never been determined. Now homeless, the Van Diver family really didn't have a whole lot of options. Then their neighbor, Messamore, offered to let them move in with him. Since they didn't really have anywhere else to go, the Van Divers accepted Messamore's offer and the entire family moved into Messamore's tiny farmhouse. Tom Van Diver did the farm work and Beatrice did the cooking. Neighbors reported that the arrangement had seemed to be working well. Neighbors observed that when Mr. and Mrs. Van Diver walked by, Beatrice walked by herself, about 20 to 30 feet in front of Tom, which seemed odd. The last time anyone saw the Van Divers was January 7, 1949, when they went to the mailbox to retrieve their mail, as usual. Unfinished business, Van Diver received unemployment compensation checks and two were waiting at the post office when he went missing, as well as a notice in his mailbox. 
He also had requested a duplicate deed to his farm since the original had been destroyed in the fire. Since Messamore was out of town, suspicious amateur sleuths ascended Saltwell Hill to the Messamore farm without a search warrant. Reported evidence they uncovered appeared to be bullet holes under the window of Mr. and Mrs. Van Diver's bedroom, a burned wheelbarrow, bone fragments, tracks leading to the edge of the cliff, including both footprints and wheelbarrow tracks, remains of a fire and other debris. A few days later, searchers broke into Messamore's house looking for clues or evidence in the Van Diver disappearance, still without a search warrant. Another neighbor, Irma Hughes, suspected that Messamore had stolen his blue tick hound dog and reported the theft to the authorities. Where are the Van Divers? The search for the Van Diver family continued relentlessly. Officials and volunteers combed the hills, sinkholes, cliffs, ditches, gullies, and caves in the Hemlock Cliffs area looking for anything which might offer a lead or connection to the Van Diver family. The family's clothes, shoes, and other personal items were still in the Messamore farmhouse. Sheriff Lane stumbled on a clue when he discovered a shallow grave in the yard, but it turned out to contain the body of the Van Diver's dog. Messamore said later that he shot the dog because it howled. When Messamore returned to Crawford County from Louisville, he reported the family missing on January 19, 1949, 12 days after they disappeared. He professed his innocence and denied any knowledge of their whereabouts. Messamore said he had been out of town, so he was just as puzzled as everybody else as to where the Van Diver family had disappeared to. He said he noticed they were missing when he returned from a trip to Louisville on January 8th, but did not report their disappearance until January 19th. He said he had been out west to Olympia, Washington, where he had withdrawn $1,000 in cash out of the bank where he had it deposited. He said he raised the money by making trinkets and toys and selling novelties while he was in prison. Prison officials reported he also ran a pool room, gambling devices, store, and loan money to fellow prisoners while he was incarcerated between 1938 and 1947. Messamore was annoyed because his farm, house, and property had been searched in his absence. Messamore arrested in Louisville and extradited to Crawford County, Indiana. In February, 1949, Messamore was arrested by Louisville patrolman Edward Burnett. He had also been sought by Kentucky authorities at the time of the Van Diver disappearance for failure to report to a parole officer. Messamore was extradited to Indiana. Police report. As to his reputation, he is known by various members of the Louisville Police Department and especially Officer Ed Burnett, a veteran of that department, as being a dangerous criminal and was generally armed and has been known to resist arrest. And on one occasion, attempted to shoot Officer Burnett. February 12, 1949, Messamore was charged with grand larceny, dog napping, and suspicion of murder, Van Diver disappearance, by Indiana State Police, Jasper, Indiana. He was held without bail. The dog napping charge stemmed from Irma Hughes' accusation that Messamore had stolen his blue tick hound worth $30. Messamore was transported to Cordon, Harrison County for safekeeping and further questioning about the disappearance 
of the Van Divers. This is a map of Harrison County, Indiana, which borders Crawford County to the west. Cordon, the county seat and first state capital of Indiana, is located in the center of the county. Messamore was taken to the supposedly escape-proof Harrison County Jail in downtown Cordon. This jail building, located at 233 North Capitol Avenue, is no longer standing. It was raised and replaced in the 1960s with Harrison County's 4th Jail. Currently, the Harrison County Discovery Center is in the former jail site. Notice the narrow escape alley to the left side of the jail. This is an aerial view of Corridon. The jail site sits at the corner of North Capitol and Cherry Street, diagonally, diagonally to the right across from the first state capitol building. Indiana Historical Bureau historical marker, which marks the site of four historic Harrison County jails. The Corridon State Bank located south of the jail, now serves as the Corridon Town Hall. Messamore was questioned repeatedly about the Van Diver family. While in custody in the Harrison County Jail, Messamore made a startling confession on the advice of Harrison County Prosecutor Eugene E. Shine Feller. During questioning, Messamore had let something slip about the money he had on hand. He told investigators, if you let me rest tonight, I will tell you something in the morning. True to his word, Messamore confessed to taking part in an unsolved Kevill, Kentucky bank robbery on August 12, 1948, effectively trading the minor dog napping charge in Crawford County for a much more serious armed bank robbery charge in Kentucky. Messamore confesses to bank robbery. In a three and one half page statement, Messamore confessed that he and two others had pulled off a $19,000 bank robbery in Kevill, Kentucky back on August 12, 1948 after his 1947 parole. He tried to implicate Tom Van Diver in the bank robbery, but nobody really believed that part of his story because there was no evidence to indicate Van Diver's involvement. The rest of the Kevill bank robbery story did check out with the FBI, however, and Messamore, Thomas White Gore, and Charles Charlie Edward Stiegel were all eventually arrested in the Kevill Bank job. The location of Kevill, Kentucky is in Ballard County. Kevill is 15 miles from Paducah, Kentucky. The Kevill Bank robbery details. Job pulled off by William Desi Messamore, Thomas White Gore, and Charles Edward Stiegel. Messamore transported Stiegel and Gore to Paducah in his 46 Hudson. Stiegel stole the getaway car from a Paducah huge car lot an hour before the robbery on the pretext that he wanted to test drive the 47 Chevy because he was interested in buying it. Meanwhile, Messamore drove his own car to the vicinity of Cavill, about four miles out of town, and waited to be picked up by Gordon Stiegel in the stolen car for the short drive to the bank. Gore waited in the getaway car, while Messamore and Stiegel, carrying guns, entered the bank around noon on August 12, 1948, and ordered bank employees and customers into the vault at gunpoint. The three robbers escaped with over $19,000. As the robbers drove away, they fired four shots into the radiator of a bystander's automobile because he was watching events unfold. 
They also fired shots with their pistols at pedestrians as the trio made their escape out of town, guns ablazing. The robbers drove to where Messamore's car was concealed in a wooded lot, ditched the stolen getaway car, and drove away with the loot. The three had gotten away with the bank heist for six months, from August 12, 1948, until March 1949, when Messamore made the confession that implicated all three of them. Messamore was already incarcerated, and Gore and Stiegel were captured together in a Vicksburg, Mississippi motel in March 1949. Escape! Jailbreak! March 14, 1949. Messamore on the loose. After he confessed to the bank robbery, Messamore was being held in the Harrison County Jail in Corridon in his second floor jail cell. He continually pestered Harrison County Sheriff Walter Baxley for a change of clothes. Sheriff Baxley and Deputy Sheriff Clarence Clee brought Messamore's suitcase into the cell and set it down on the cot, and Messamore began to riffle through the clothes in the suitcase. Before Baxley and Clee knew what had happened, Messamore had somehow managed to maneuver between them and the cell door. Messamore rushed out of the cell, banging the cell door shut, locking in the sheriff and deputy, and taking the keys with him. As Messamore rushed toward the stairwell to go downstairs, he slammed a solid steel door behind him. When it bounced back open, Clee fired his revolver once at Messamore, forcing him to alter his course. Instead of going downstairs, he charged back upstairs, ducked under a stepladder, and ran into the second floor bathroom and refused to come out. He smashed through the bathroom window and jumped out in a shower of glass. It was about a 25-foot drop. Messamore later commented, it shook me up some. He grabbed hold of metalwork on the side of the Cordon State Bank, the building to the south of the jail, to attempt to break his fall and landed in the alley to complete his escape from the Harrison County Jail in Cordon, Indiana. Uh, we have a reenactment of the Messamore escape through the alley south of the site of the Harrison County Jail in Cordon, Indiana. This is me, not Messamore. He would have been about 30 years younger than me and about 30 pounds heavier. I got away too. No excitement was generated because nobody paid any attention on a sleepy Friday afternoon after the sidewalks were already rolled up in Corridon. Life in a small town. While sitting inside the locked jail cell, Sheriff Baxley calmly gave his wife instructions. Sheriff Baxley told his wife, who was down on the first floor of the jail, to stay calm. First, Sheriff Baxley asked her to contact the Indiana State Police and let them know about the escape of Messamore. Next, he instructed his wife to call the local garage and ask them to send somebody over with an acetylene torch to cut Deputy Clee and himself out of the jail cell. Claude Stonecipher, a local mechanic, was assisted by Dudley Kamick as they used the requested acetylene torch to cut the two officers out of the jail cell. Claude Stonecipher cutting open the door of Messamore's former cell with the acetylene torch. Dudley Kamick in the front, Claude Stonecipher with the torch, Sheriff Walter Baxley behind Stonecipher, and Deputy Sheriff Clarence Clee in the background, 
behind Baxley. It took about one hour for Stone Cipher and Kamek to get the cell door open. Afterward, Deputy Clee remarked, It seemed a lot longer. Claude Stone Cipher with Sheriff Walt Baxley and Deputy Clee in the background. A narrow escape alley between the jail on the left and the former Corden State Bank on the right taken from the Oak Street side. At the corner of North Capitol and Cherry Street, the alley is still there. It is still a tight squeeze and is gated on the east end toward the Capitol. Messamore dashed through, then hitched a ride away from the heart of downtown. The alley today, on the left we're looking west, on the right we're looking east. I even found a WHAS radio interview with Sheriff Baxley. It is one minute and 49 seconds long. It was recorded immediately after Messamore's escape. The link to the audio of Sheriff Baxley's interview is printed in the comment section for this video. Just click on the link or copy and paste the link in to your browser. The interview is housed in the Berea Special Collections and archives. Meanwhile, naturally, there was a great deal of commotion in downtown Corridan. In addition to the officers of the law, members of the general public turned into amateur detectives, sleuths, and investigators. Many members of this volunteer posse were armed and joined in the search. Businesses shut down, school buses were stopped, Roadblocks were set up, and everybody in the area was questioned as news reporters converged on the tiny town and everybody was asking the same question. Have you seen this man? Messamore was described as being dressed in a pine tree green shirt and pants. Many false tips and leads were traced, but they came to nothing as Messamore effectively escaped from the environs of Corridan and headed west. The Corridan Democrat of March 16, 1949 included this colorful account. Cops and robbers, theme of many movies, came to real life in Corridan Monday afternoon when it became known that William Messamore, 32, had crashed his way out of the Harrison County Jail in the true melodramatic style of the thriller type of movie after locking the sheriff and his deputy in the cell and leaping through the second-story bathroom window. Totally disinterested persons suddenly turned into their version of Sam Ketchum, Dick Tracy, Sam Spade, or any of the other popular crime stoppers of comic movie, and radio fame. Businesses, jobs, and other duties were abandoned as usually staid persons dashed over the terrain immediately surrounding Corridan in search of the escaped desperado. Only instead of mounting their trusty steeds and taking up pursuit in approved movie fashion, the local sluice jumped into cars and turned on all hundred of the horses under the hood and joined in an endless circling of all the highways and byways, each following his own home-constructed theory of the route the escaped took. Meanwhile, other hundreds of curious people, not having their horses available at the moment, were content to gather at the jail and assimilate the various rumors about the fugitives' whereabouts and expound theories of their own. Newspaper men made this historic Harrison hamlet a mecca during the afternoon, converging from all directions by motor, plane, and bus as reporters scrambled to scoop each other with both words and pictures. Path to short-lived freedom for Messamore. Messamore ran through the alley and hitched a ride with some factory workers to Keller Manufacturing Company located just east of Indian Creek. The workers later reported they noticed that he was bleeding from his hand and head 
but they said they didn't think too much about it because they didn't know anything about the jailbreak yet. Next, Messamore stealthily crossed Indian Creek and headed west over rugged terrain out Old Forest Road, stopping at, at the homes of Gary Wills and Leo Taylor. False leads abounded as Messamore continued west, stealing some clothes, a hat, and overalls to try to disguise himself. He made it to the Harrison Crawford State Forest and asked forester Philip Cresselius for directions to Shelter House No. 2. He also told Cresselius he was Sheriff Baxley's brother-in-law and was helping him pursue an escaped prisoner. He didn't mention that he was the escaped prisoner. Messamore stole a skiff from William Panair's camp in Scott Township and in the early morning hours of March 15th crossed the Ohio River into Kentucky. Officials had suspected he might be heading for his farm in Crawford County. But if that was indeed his plan, he changed course and crossed over into Kentucky, which may have been his plan all along. The Indianapolis Times of March 15, 1949, provided this description of the pursuit. The posse tracked him to the river edge early today. Messamore's boots bore a distinctly recognizable pattern. Messamore apparently eluded his pursuers by doubling back and following in their footsteps. The posse trailed him to a 60-acre grove about 15 miles from Corridon. They found footprints near a skiff beached on the shore of the river and concluded that Messamore had taken to the swollen stream in a desperate escape attempt. The posse continued to search farther down the beach. Within a few minutes, they returned, only to find that the skiff had disappeared. It was believed that the 32-year-old fugitive was hidden watching the movements of his pursuers and then he made away with the skiff as soon as the posse left the scene. The Ohio, still high from winter floods, is about three quarters of a mile wide where it bounds the woods. Captured in Brandenburg. Messamore was taken back into custody the next morning, March 15th, while calmly drinking a cup of coffee in a Meade County, Kentucky restaurant in Brandenburg. The headline read, Kentucky Deputy Seizes Messamore at Restaurant. News of Messamore's capture ended a 22-hour search by a weary posse which had trailed Messamore's escape route. Messamore prophetically told officials, You won't keep me long. Messamore out again, under guard. William D. Messamore, center in cap, is shown leaving the jail at Brandenburg, Kentucky, where he was captured yesterday morning. He is on the way to the federal building at Louisville for arraignment. Messamore is accompanied by Deputy Marshals Evan Aiken, Left, and Harold Hall. Another view of Messamore and his escort for the transfer from Brandenburg to Louisville, Kentucky. Applying the old saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, Kentucky decided to keep Messamore. This time, Kentucky didn't want to give Messamore back to Indiana and declined extradition. He was charged with the Cavill, Kentucky bank robbery he had confessed to while being held in Harrison County Jail in Indiana. Of course, Indiana wanted to get him back to attempt to clear up the Van Diver's disappearance. Messamore was questioned repeatedly about the Van Divers, but he steadfastly denied any knowledge of their fate or whereabouts. He was held in chains under maximum security in the Louisville jail, then transferred to the McCracken County Jail in Paducah, Kentucky, for safe keeping. Messamore's farmhouse also burned to the ground on April 13, 1949, while he was in jail in Kentucky. In 1951, his mother filed suit seeking settlement on a $2,500 insurance policy. 
It was reported that the fire was set by a neighbor who was tired of all the hoopla generated by the hundreds of sightseers and investigators, both official and amateur, who flocked to the area to search for clues in the Van Diver disappearance. The words combing the hills were often used for the ongoing inch-by-inch inch searches and investigations. But that didn't discourage people from relentlessly searching for clues around the rest of the area. His former neighbor, Hughes, recalled busloads of people coming in to explore the property and surrounding locales. Headline, Paducah Sun-Times, June 15, 1949. Search for Mesomore spreads over several states after daring jailbreak. Messamore broke out of the McCracken County Jail again, three months to the day after his coordinate escape on June 14, 1949 at 7 a.m. This time, he did it by sawing his way out using hacksaw blades, which had been concealed by a trusty cook inside a magazine. Messamore paid $13.50 for the blades. Messamore later said that he worked for many nights, sawing his way out of the cell. The bars were supposed to be sawproof because inside each bar was another metal bar that was designed to revolve to keep a saw blade from biting into it. After Messamore got out of his cell, he slugged the deputy jailer, William Owens, knocking him unconscious and stealing the jail keys. He also seriously injured Bobby Owens, the 17-year-old son of William Owens, by hitting him over the head. Bobby was sitting downstairs in the jail office, and Messamore tried to make him reveal where the revolver kept at the jail was located, but he refused. For a weapon... Messamore used a four-pound, ten-inch-long segment of one of the bars he sawed through. Messamore was indicted in September 1949 for beating the Owens. Messamore pulled the telephone wire loose, unlocked the jail office, escaped across the jail yard, and headed, again, toward the Ohio River. He spent most of the day hiding out along the river. After an extensive manhunt, Messamore was captured at Princeton, Kentucky at 9 a.m. the next morning, cold and hungry, after boarding a freight train bound for Louisville, which was stopped by police. Messamore was hiding inside a coal boxcar. He had a hacksaw blade concealed in his shoe when he was arrested. Chicago, jailbuster William D. Messamore, above, cracked his way out for a second time in three months, sawing bars in Paducah, Kentucky County Jail, and slugging a deputy jailer in the getaway. He escaped from the court in jail in March. Messamore was awaiting trial for a $9,000 bank robbery. Sheriff Baxley and Deputy Cleve empathetically identified with the embarrassment of Paducah officials after Messamore's latest escape. A court in newspaper reported in June 1949 the expressions of embarrassment displayed by the court and police after Messamore got away were slowly changing to ones of understanding and perhaps sympathy for the Kentucky authorities. Charges in the Cavill, Kentucky bank robbery case against William Desi Messamore, Charles Edward Stiegel, and Thomas White Gore. Two counts. Count number one charged that Messamore, Gore, and Stiegel did enter a building used as a bank to wit the Cavill Bank at Cavill, Kentucky, with intent to commit therein a felony or larceny and carried away with intent to steal 
or purloined property and money in the sum of $19,387.25 belonging to the said Keville Bank, an insured institution of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Count 2 charged that the defendants did enter a building used as a bank by force and violence and by the use of a dangerous weapon, to wit, a revolver, did put in jeopardy the life of Mrs. Linda Hook and others in stealing or purloining property and money. Defendants plead not guilty. They're convicted, but all appeal. Each and all of the defendants denied any connection or complicity in the robbery of the bank, and each undertook to show that on the day of the robbery, he was elsewhere than in the vicinity of Paducah, Kentucky, where a car was stolen, and Campbell, Kentucky, where the bank was robbed. Messamore pled guilty to the jail escape charge. Messamore, Stiegel, and Gore all pleaded not guilty to the bank robbery charges. All were found guilty. Messamore and Stiegel received 25 years, and Gore received 20 years. Messamore was given three additional years for jail breaking. After the trial, they filed multiple appeals, but remained incarcerated. The Daily Banner of Greencastle, Indiana, Thursday, June 23, 1949, provided this account. Paducah, Kentucky, United Press. William Desi Messamore, who specializes in jailbreaks, faces 28 years in federal prison for robbing the Cavill, Kentucky Bank and later breaking out of county jail here. Messamore and his two aides in the bank robbery were convicted by a federal jury here yesterday afternoon and sentenced three hours later by Judge Roy Shelbourne. Messamore received a 25-year sentence for his part in the bank robbery and a three-year sentence for his guilty plea to the jailbreaking charge. Partners in crime, Charles Stiegel, Louisville, received a 25-year sentence, and Thomas C. Gore, Louisville, received a 20-year term. None of the prisoners displayed any emotion when the sentences were deposed, but immediately after the verdicts were read, Messamore hustled up to the judge to protest his instructions to the jury. The prison to which he will be sent has not been announced, but Atlanta is considered the likely one. Some sources indicated Messamore may be taken to Alcatraz. Here are the details from interviews with Messamore by prison officials. Messamore was quite a talker. Officials reported, he talks well and rather profusely, but they doubted his veracity. When Messamore was interviewed about the offense, he presented a long rambling account of unrelated offenses, and it was quite apparent that during the entire interview, he was attempting to formulate and fabricate stories which, of course, appear untrue. He stated that he pled not guilty to the charge of bank robbery and does not care to make a statement regarding the matter at this time. He states that he was arrested on a minor charge of dog stealing in Indiana, was extradited from Kentucky, and subsequently escaped from the Indiana jail claiming that he had considerable trouble with the sheriff there. He presented a long, rambling story regarding his treatment and discrimination there in Indiana. Messamore stated that during a further investigation, he was about to be rearrested and returned to Indiana to be sentenced under an habitual offender law. And during the time of his escape, trying to escape being returned to Indiana, he trumped up a phony bank robbery deal claiming that himself and Van Diver, whose whereabouts are unknown, were involved. During the time of the interview, the subject was rather hazy regarding his association with the two co-defendants. He claims he met Stiegel while they were incarcerated in Eddyville Penitentiary 
and it is not Nogor, since he was a friend of Stegel only. During the course of the interview, Messamore was questioned quite at length regarding the feeling between him and his two co-defendants, and he states that he has no bad will or ill feeling. It is apparent from other information coming to the attention of officials that he implicated the others and drew them into his plan. This indicates that the subject is doing everything possible to keep from returning to Indiana since he was suspicioned in the murder of several people, this matter not being cleared up. Messamore states that he pleads guilty to the jailbreak and gives as his reason that he was put through the third degree on several different occasions and he was denied the right to an attorney, federal agents held up his mail, and he was simply depressed at the time of his actions. He claimed that the mistreatment at the time was due to the three $100 bills he had on his person and the $10,000 which he claimed to have in a lockbox in Olympia, Washington. Messamore charges with their registry numbers. Number 3722, armed robbery. Number 3725, escape. In the Western District of Kentucky, Paducah, Messamore was sentenced to a term of 25 years for armed robbery and three years for escape to run consecutively with armed robbery charge for a total of 28 years. Sentence began June 22, 1949, when he was found guilty. Messamore was eligible for parole on October 21, 1958, eligible for conditional release for good time behavior on April 9, 1968, expires full term on June 21, 1977. Messamore's mugshot from Atlanta Penitentiary. He was classified June 28, 1949. Messamore statistics. Height, 5 foot 9 and 1 half inches. Weight, 155 pounds. Complexion, light. Hair, brown. Eyes, blue. Scars and marks, a small scar under the lower lip, right. Life for Messamore after conviction. Messamore arrived at Atlanta USP on July 23, 1949 to begin serving a 28-year sentence on the charge of armed robbery and escape. Prison officials noted that Messamore had superior intelligence. This is demonstrated by the fact that he was really good at escaping, but not so adept at remaining out of jail. Because of his past connections at Eddyville, and because his two co-defendants were also incarcerated at Atlanta, trouble was anticipated. Stiegel, one of his co-defendants, admitted that bad blood existed between himself and Messamore, since Messamore had implicated Stiegel and Gore in the bank robbery. Officials decided Messamore should be transferred to USP Leavenworth, Kansas. From there, he was sent to Alcatraz. Alcatraz history. 1859 to 1868, Military Fortress. 1861 to 1934, U.S. Military Prison. 1934 to 1963, U.S. Federal Prison. 1969 to 1971, Home for Native Americans. 1972 to the present, part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Rule regulation number five from the Alcatraz Inmate Handbook. Privileges. You are entitled to food, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. Anything else that you get is a privilege. It's a picture of Alcatraz Lighthouse circa 1940s when Messamore was there. Prisoner, 868. Admitted bank robber and two-time escapee got him time in the most notorious prison of all time, Alcatraz. 
He was assigned number 868 William Desi Messimore. Because of his escapes and the armed bank robbery charges, he was sent to Alcatraz. He arrived at Alcatraz on March 22, 1950. He would live out his time here until October 17, 1962, when he was transported to another reformatory in Terre Haute, Indiana. Messimore, number 868, Alcatraz Mugshot, March 22, 1950, arrival at Alcatraz. Age 33, complexion, medium, height, 5 foot 9 and a half inches, weight, 163, eyes, light gray, hair, mixed gray, build, medium, scars and marks, he had some on his thumb and on his palm. His crime, armed bank robbery and escape. Prison records show that Messimore was labeled as very intelligent, IQ 125, and suffered from a constitutional psychopathic state they labeled as criminalism. He also struggled with depression, anger, and telling the truth. Messamore ages, a later mugshot. He provided this list of aliases to prison officials. Robert Willis Sparks, Bill Davis, Bill Colgate, Buck Wilson, William Colgate. Messamore appeals his ruling. This is from the Courier Journal of June 27, 1951. Messamore, who is in Alcatraz prison, filed on the grounds that he was not properly represented by his attorney in his trial here. His attorney was Foster Stone of Louisville, who Messamore said had not been aggressive on making appeals. Messamore's appeal was denied on December 9, 1953. William Desi Messamore's mother died in 1961 while he was in Alcatraz. He was not listed as a survivor. Surviving are a son, James E. Colgate, three grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. The Crawford County Farm was deeded to Messamore while he was in prison in early 1963. Messamore paid taxes on the place diligently while he was incarcerated. The farm was deeded to Mrs. Beatrice Ferris on June 7, 1971. Throughout the years of continuing investigations by local officials, state police, the FBI, detectives, reporters, and amateur sleuths into the Van Diver disappearance, false leads, which could not be proved, popped up repeatedly. Nobody really believed Messamore's story about his innocence in the Van Diver's disappearance, and the investigation continued, complete with false sightings of members of the Van Diver family. Here are some examples that proved to be fruitless, false or unproven leads in the Van Diver disappearance. Possible leads. Continuing reports of sightings of members of the Van Diver family throughout Indiana, Kentucky, and other areas proved fruitless. On January 24th, the missing family was reported to have been seen alive and well. It was also a report from New Albany that Wanda had applied for a job at a New Albany restaurant. She never showed up to work, though. A body found in the river, not missing woman. This was on April 6, 1950 at Newburgh. Sheriff Marcus O. Lane said today that a body found in the Ohio was not that of Mrs. Beatrice Van Diver. Sheriff Lane said the presence of an operation scar on the woman's right side barred the possibility it was Mrs. Van Diver since she had no such operation. Promising lead linked to Ohio River. In December 1950, almost a year after the Van Diver's disappearance, a former cellmate of Messimore's called from Chicago. He identified himself as Wilbur Funk of New Albany and posed as a self-styled intermediary for Messamore. 
he contacted authorities with a tip that Messamore had told him that the Van Divers' bodies had been weighted and dumped in the Ohio River. But dragging efforts failed to produce results, and this was declared a false lead. Messamore linked to Jules. Jules found missing trios case revolve, revived. This was newspaper headlines on October 31st, 1952, Louisville United Press. Jewelry belonging to the long-missing Van Diver family of Crawford County was discovered in a lockbox registered to William Desi Messamore in Olympia, Washington. Interest was revived in the case, and Messamore was brought to Louisville for further questioning in the Van Diver disappearance. But he was returned to Alcatraz to complete his original sentence. Torchlight Search in August 1954, Harrison County Prosecutor Eugene Feller led a torchlight search into a newly discovered cave near the Messamore Farm, hoping to find a clue or traces of the Van Diver family. No new evidence was discovered which shed any additional light on the mystery, however. Attorneys Frank O'Bannon and Foster Stone examined a skeleton found on Sand Island in, not, in 1958 not the Van Divers. In the 1950s, Crawford County Sheriff Harvey Jones and a state police inspector discovered a sandstone cliff in the county that they believed could have been created by a dynamite blast to cover the bodies. No bodies were found, however. A skeleton was found in the area in November 1960, but it turned out to be a man who had disappeared from Leavenworth. In 1983, two skeletons were found near the Messamore Place, but after examination, the Indiana University Forensic Department determined they were prehistoric Native Americans, not the Van Divers. Messamore was released from federal custody to Kentucky authorities. After serving 16 and one half years in federal custody, Messamore was released at the Terre Haute USP on December 14, 1965, by mandatory release. He was then turned over to the Vigo County, Indiana Sheriff, who released him to Kentucky authorities on a parole violation warrant and was sent to Eddyville, Kentucky State Penitentiary. Messamore appealed in 1971 to ask to be released from reporting to federal parole in order to obtain release from Eddyville State Prison. The substance of Appellant's contention was that when he was apprehended in Kentucky on the Indiana and federal charges, the Kentucky authorities knew that he was a parole violator, and when he was released to foreign authorities, Kentucky lost jurisdiction to re-imprison for parole violation. The ruling was upheld, and Messimore re remained behind bars in Eddyville Penitentiary till he was quietly paroled on October 10th. 1973. His final discharge date was January 27, 1984. Here's Messamore's handwriting letter of appeal. Investigator Crawford County Sheriff Pete Eastridge. Crawford County Sleuth Estel Wayne Pete Eastridge, who was born on March 27, 1930 at Riddle, Indiana, embarked on a personal examination of the Messamore investigation in the 1980s. Eastridge was elected Crawford County Sheriff five times. He also served in the U.S. Army in Korea, where he said he learned discipline. Mysterious Handwritten Note Eastridge received a mysterious handwritten note, postmarked Kentucky, which provided directions to a location south of Eckerty, of great interest to you. It was signed, Colonel. At first, Eastridge thought it was a joke, but he looked up Messamore at his home in Louisville and met with him there. Eastridge described his visit to Messamore's home at a meeting of the Crawford County Historical Society on May 11, 1992. His house was booby-trapped. His bed was camouflaged. He told you where to sit. Tunnels were dug under his house. He told Eastridge he trusted him 
but he watched him like a hawk when Eastridge went out to his car for a moment during the interview. In a 1986 article in the Court and Democrat, Eastridge described Messamore as odd, but a good host. He had been meeting with Messamore in Messamore's home in Louisville's Highland Park neighborhood. Eastridge said, I had a long visit with him one Sunday. He's a hard fellow to figure out. He kind of talks in poetry. You don't really know whether he's telling you something or not. He talked in riddles. He contradicted himself. Why did Messamore confess to the Cavill, Kentucky Bank robbery? Sheriff Eastridge speculated that Messamore confessed to get the murder suspicion over in Crawford County, Indiana, off his back. Messamore himself said that he confessed to the bank robbery to get out of Indiana's jurisdiction. Messamore stated he felt that he was not treated well during his Indiana confinement. After his release by Kentucky, Messamore appeared to lead a quiet, under-the-radar lifestyle in Louisville's Highland Park neighborhood, which was originally created for l and railroad workers. Messamore lived there in the 1970s and 1980s, residing at 4529 Louisville Avenue. The residential area has since been raised to facilitate the expansion around the Louisville Airport. Reported quirks of Messamore during his later years of living alone in Highland Park. He kept old clothes in an old refrigerator. He periodically aired them out, then refolded them and put them back in the refrigerator. His house was filled with trinkets, although nothing of value. He frequently offered to give items such as clothes or drapes to his neighbors. He often talked in riddles. Soon after he moved in, Messamore dug out a room underneath his house, which he kept bolted and locked with a padlock. He told a neighbor he used that room to keep cool in the summer. Prior to his death, Messamore had eaten lunch nearly every day for five years at the nutrition program at Highland Park Community Center, although no one seemed to know him very well. Messamore was still a mystery and a loner who never seemed to bother anyone in the Highland Park neighborhood. The end for William Desi Messamore, obituaries. Courier Journal, February 15, 1986. Humana Hospital University is seeking the next of kin of a Louisville man who died there Wednesday. William Messamore, 69, of 4529 Louisville Avenue, died of natural causes, according to a social worker for the hospital. Anyone with information on Messamore should call the hospital. Courier Journal, May 6, 1986. Messamore, a 69-year-old ex-convict who spent his last years in Louisville, died February 12th at Humana Hospital University. His body was donated to the University of Louisville Medical School for research, according to Michael Green, an attorney handling Messamore's estate. A recap of the mysterious Messamore case in a Courier-Journal article February 16, 1986. In the early 1950s, Messamore was questioned about a family who had disappeared from his Crawford County, Indiana farm without a trace. On January 7, 1949, members of the missing family were Thomas Van Diver, his wife Beatrice, and her daughter from another marriage, Wanda Johnson. The family had been living with Messamore on his farm near English when they disappeared. The Van Diver investigation led to a confession from Messamore that he had been part of a Cavill, Kentucky bank robbery. Police worked for years to solve the Van Diver mystery, while Messamore served a 28-year prison sentence, including time at Alcatraz for the bank robbery and a Paducah jailbreak. He was eventually paroled. No one was ever charged in the Van Diver case, although authorities always suspected the case was murder and thought Messamore was involved. Messamore mystery is... Still a mystery. H.O. Whitey Jones Commentary on the Messamore Mystery. 
His neighbors were so suspicious of his activities that 35 years later, after Massimore had spent most of his life behind bars for bank robbery and breaking jail, there were few who did not believe that he had done the Van Divers in. In February 1986, retired Indiana State Police Detective Wendelin Wendy Opal, who worked diligently on the Van Diver case, made this remark in an interview with the Courier Journal. Authorities always suspected the case was murder and thought Messamore was involved. Sheriff Pete Eastridge had been probing the case for several years and hoped to find something in Messamore's house in Louisville or his writings. Messamore had numerous mysterious notebooks filled with strange writings after Messamore passed away. If he did find out anything there, Eastridge did not reveal it publicly, saying that old man was a mystery all his life, and I guess he still is. Eastridge further stated, the bodies will never be found. Here's an excerpt from the used interview on clever intuition about what Messamore reportedly said. No hard evidence of the remains of the family nor any other person were ever found, and if there were, it was never proved due to weak technology. Yet the suspicion remains overwhelmingly in favor of Messamore. It was acknowledged by Hughes that Messamore had many private conversations with Pete Eastridge, Sheriff of Crawford County. Messamore had told Eastridge once, no one knows what I'm about to tell you, and if it gets out, I'll know where it came from. You said that Messamore had confessed to Pete that he had killed the entire family. He said that he had cut the family members up on the kitchen table and put mismatched parts into barrels. He also reportedly admitted killing up to five others besides the Van Divers. When asked why, he simply replied, they were in my way. Bear in mind that Messamore was given multiple lie detector tests about the Van Divers and other notoriously questionable events and activities in his life. Detective Captain John R. Barton, test administrator, declared, The man is telling so many lies, we can't decide which parts of the story, if any, are truth. This maxim may have served as a template throughout Messamore's life, influencing his conversations, confrontations, interviews, interrogations, relationships, business dealings, schemes, etc. I'm going to change just one word in the above quote by Detective Barton and apply it to Messamore's baffling life. The man is telling so many lies, he, meaning Messamore, can't decide which part of the story, if any, are truth. As Marcus O. Lane, Crawford County Sheriff, during the Van Diver disappearance years, remarked, you have to have a body to charge someone with murder. The mystery of Messamore may never be solved. Messamore took the true story of what happened to the Van Divers and probably other secrets as well with him when he died in 1986. It may seem inconceivable that the three bodies of the Van Divers could be concealed despite rigorous investigations by the FBI, state police, County officials, reporters, historians, and countless professional and amateur detectives for 70 plus years, but it seems even more inconceivable that an entire living family of three could simply vanish without a trace and remain hidden without a trace for all these years. Who, besides this man, William Desi Messamore really knows the answer to the Van Diver mystery. <laughs>